And so, uh, you know, the last few weeks, we've been talking about how to. Somebody say how to. And, and, and I shared with you the last couple of weeks how that as a young believer, I, I used to go to church. And uh, my pastor was a great pastor. He was a great, he was a great minister, a great preacher of the word. And uh, I, I remember when, when I would sit there and listen to my pastor and take notes and, and just try to get everything that I could. I remember thinking to myself, yeah, but how? And my pastor was, a, like I said, he was a great Pastor, he was a great preacher, and, and he would, you know, he would get up and, and, and tell me that, you know, I loved, needed to love my wife. He would tell me that I needed to read the word. He would tell me that I needed to pray. He would tell me that, I, you know, all the things as a believer that I needed to do in order to get strong in God. But if there was any weakness, it was that he would tell us what we needed to do, but not how to do it. And as a young believer, I remember walking away going, yeah, yeah but pastor, how? And so what, we're, what we've been uh, trying to do over the past couple of weeks is, is, is give you some news you can use and help you to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And so we began uh, about four weeks ago talking about how to have peace in the midst of your storm. And then we talked about how to know the will of God for your life. And last week we talked about how to be thankful in tough times. And today we're going to be talking about how to face your fear. Some say how to face your fear. Say it like you mean it, how to face your fear. Turn to your neighbor, tell them, uh, you're going to learn how to face your fear today. All right, hopefully we're going to give you some news that you can use, and when you leave today, you'll be able to apply the Word of God to your life. Because it's not just enough to come in and listen, but we've got to be doers when we go outside. Are you with me? How many in the back are with me? Okay, some say, I'm with you, Pastor. Okay, now, now, now how many have ever heard of Ann Landers? You ever... Some, some of you that about my age, Ann, Ann Landers, she was a syndicated columnist. And Ann used to receive all kinds of letters. And in fact, in her heyday, it said that she received 10,000 letters a month. Now, this was before email. This was before you could tweet. This was before, you know, all of those kinds of things. And so she would receive, through snail mail, 10,000 letters a month. And she would give advice to these people. They would write to her and say, you know, Ann, I've got this problem, and, and can, you, can you give me some advice? And, and she was asked, Ann, over all the years that you've done this and all the letters that you've read and all the advice that you've given and all the problems that you've dealt with, what is like the number one problem that you dealt with? Can you, can you, can you give us... The, 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 the biggest problem that Americans face, and without any hesitation, she said this, and I'm going to quote. She said, the number one problem above all others in America seems to be fear. She said, people are afraid of losing their health, their wealth, their loved ones, and people are afraid of life itself. She said, many Americans are living lives Filled with fear. Isn't that amazing? I, I read that and I thought to myself, wow, I think she hit the nail on the head. Many people are afraid of life itself. And many Americans live their lives filled with fear. Now, God hasn't called us to live in fear. He's called us to walk by faith. And today, hopefully, we're going to help you to do that. There are over seven, as I was studying, I found out that there are over 700 kinds of fear in the dictionary. You can open up any kind of, any dictionary today and you can begin in A and you can go through Z and you will find 700 different kinds of fear. How many of you know what arachnophobia is? There's your A right there. Arachnophobia, if you don't know, it's a fear of spiders. How many of you have a fear of spiders? How many of you, spiders just freak you out? All right. Well, I think, I think a lot of us know what arachnophobia is because of the movie that came out a few years ago. But I think probably few of us know what acrophobia is. Acrophobia is the fear of heights. Anybody there? That's me. I'll just confess right now. I'll, I'll be honest with you. You get me up on a tall building, I will not go to the edge. Because if I go to the edge, I turn into a nine-year-old girl. With pigtails and freckles and a high voice. 
Heights freak me out. There are some other things that freak me out. Snakes. Snakes freak me out. Cockroaches freak me out. If you want to see me jump out of bed, throw a cockroach in the and I'm gone. I'm out the house, in the car, down the road, in 2.5 seconds flat. There are all kinds of things that, that, that freak us out. Some of you, it's, it's acrophobia like me. Some of you, it's agoraphobia, which is the fear of open places. We all know what ca claustrophobia is, the fear of closed places. Well, there's, there's something called acrophobia. Acrophobia is a place, and I, I take a look at guys like, I think, acro I love wide open spaces. Get me out in the field, and I'm at home. But some people, you put them out in the field with nothing around them, <laughs> and they don't know what to do. So there's acrophobia, there's agoraphobia, there's claustrophobia. Some of you, some of you are filled with ergophobia. What's ergophobia? It's the fear of work. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and tell him, I think he's talking about you. It's like the one guy said, he said, he said I'm not afraid of work. I just, lay, I just find work and I lay down beside it and go to sleep. But there are all kinds of, all kinds of fears. Pathophobia. Pathophobia is the fear of disease. Photophobia is the fear of light. Phobophobia phobia is the fear of fear. Come on, pastor, there's no such thing as a fear of fear. Yeah, it's called phobophobia, the fear of fear. And there are some people that are afraid they're going to be afraid. They're afraid they're going to be afraid, so they're constantly afraid. And because they're afraid, they're afraid that they're going to be afraid. And so they're afraid. How many of you know? Man, they're mixed up. So there are all kinds of fears. Those are just a few of them. There are over 700 of them in the dictionary. And we all face fears. We all have a fear of, of some kind, whether it's a fear of going old, growing old or the fear of being alone or the fear of lo losing our job or the fear of not living up to our parents' expectations or whatever it is, the fear of failure. There's all kinds of fears that we deal with every day. And, and, and many of us, we're not to the, to the point to where that young lady was who sat down with me and said, Pastor, pray for me because I, 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 you know, I, I have these chest pains and I feel like a 1,000 pounds upon my shoulders and I, I can't hardly breathe. See, we don't have panic attacks, but some of you do. And so how do we get past our fear? How do we get over that? Well, today we're going to take a look at that. And if you've got your Bibles, I'd like for you to take them and turn with me to Exodus chapter 14. And we're going to take a look at that scripture that the brother talked about. And we're going to look at a guy named Moses. Some say Moses. And today, we're going to talk about how to face your fears. Exodus chapter 14. If you're getting there on your cell phone or if you're getting there on your iPad or if you're, if you're turning pages, uh, once you're there, say, I'm there. If you're ready, say, let's go. If you're not there, say, give me a moment. Okay, good. Everybody's there. Exodus 14, beginning in verse 1. If you're ready, say, let's go. Okay, here we go. I expect you to talk to me, all right? So the Bible says, then the Lord said to Moses. Somebody say the Lord. The Lord. The Lord. Then the Lord. The Lord. If you've got a, if you've got a Bible and you want to circle that, uh, I, I encourage you to circle that. The Lord said to Moses. This was God's idea. They're, they, you know, they're, they're 430 years in bondage. God sends Moses into Egypt, delivers them out with a high hand by the power of God. They enter into the wilderness, they're headed toward the promised land, and they've been traveling for five days. Now, five days ago, they were in victory. Today, they're facing fear. Five days ago, the power of God. Today, they don't know what to do. Five days ago, they knew God was with them. Today, they're wondering where he is. And it's amazing how that you can go from Sunday and victory to Friday and defeat. See, some of you today are shouting, but you don't know what, 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 what's going to happen around the corner. You don't know what phone call you're going to get. You don't know what's going what's to take place tomorrow. And, 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 by, and for some of you, and I'm not, I'm not prophesying bad things. I'm just saying I know how life happens. And we can be doing good one day, and just a few days later, we can be questioning whether or not God even exists. 
And so that's what's happened to him. The Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp at a place called Pihahira, between Migdal and the sea. And the Bible says that they are to encamp by the sea directly opposite a place called Baal Zephon. And Pharaoh will think, and this is what he's going to think, the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And God said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them and I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. And further on in that chapter, the Bible says, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were Egyptians marching after them and they were terrified. Some say terrified. Circle that word terrified. In the King James Version, if you have that, it's, it's, it, 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 it says, and they were sore afraid. That's the same phrase that's used of the shepherds when they saw the angels. And the Bible says they were sore afraid. It means they were terrified. They were, they were freaked out. They were scared out of their wits. Have you ever been there? They cried out unto the Lord, and the Lord said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out into the desert to die? Now, this is what they're saying to Moses. What have you done to us? Now, five days ago, he was the king. Five days ago, Moses was awesome. Five days ago, they were singing his praise. But now, they're saying to Moses, Moses... What have you done? Come on, guys. Has your wife ever looked at you and said, what have you done? Uh, that's just me. <laughs> what have you done by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you? Didn't, didn't I tell you? Huh? Didn't I tell you? Didn't we say to you, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. I could just see somebody out there going, Moses, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians rather than die in the desert. Are you with me? Moses answered the people, and what does Moses say? Moses said, don't be afraid. Some say, don't be afraid. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, don't be afraid. Now, why are they saying all this stuff? They're saying all this stuff because they're freaked out. They're saying all this stuff because they're afraid. They're terrified. And we do crazy things when we're scared. We say stuff we don't mean when we're scared. When we don't know how we're going to pay the rent, when we don't know how we're going to, how we're going to pay the, the, the car payment, when, 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 when our life seems to be falling down around our ears, we freak out. And, and, and instead of looking to God, we turn on one another. Is it in there or not? Is that what's happening? Yeah. That's exactly what's taking place. They're turning on Moses. They're getting scared. And, and what does he say? He said, hey, here's the key. Here's the key. Here's the key, guys. Look, don't be afraid. <laughs> A lot easier said than done, Moses. Red Sea's in front of us. We're between Migdal and the sea. We've got, we're at Pihahiroth. We've got mountains on the left, and we've got mountains on the right. And there's Pharaoh. And the last time I saw him, I did this. Later for you, I thought we were past this. Are you with me? Come on. How many of you know? Sometimes we, th we, we think, hey, that, that, that's gone. And then it comes back. See, the devil's not going to let you go that easy. The world's not going to let you go that easy. Sin's not going to let you go that easy. It's going to hunt you down if it can He said, stand firm and you will see the deliverance that the Lord is going to bring you today. Ooh, yeah, I wish I had a B3 Hammond, B3. Mm, stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord's going to bring you to. Oh. The Egyptians you see today, you're never going to see again. The Lord's going to fight for you. Turn to your neighbor and tell them the Lord's going to fight for you. <laughs> you need only to be still. 
Hallelujah. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. It's a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. God, give us wisdom concerning your word. God, we don't want to come in here and lift our hands and sing some religious songs and thank God for a team that's going to Africa and bless them and pray for them and give to support that ministry and, and walk out and not be changed. God, this is the most important part of this service. God, this is the part in which we, in which we look into your word and your word says it's like a mirror. And a man is a fool who looks into a mirror and goes his own way and forgets what kind of man he was. But James said, it's not just the, 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 the hearers of the word that's going to be justified, it's the doers of the word. So Father, help us to be doers of the word. Help us to put into practice this word of God, we pray. Help us, Lord, to fight fear. Not to give in to fear. Not to walk in fear, but to walk in faith. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's children said amen. 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 Well, today as we take a look at, uh, at, at the scripture, there are three things that I see in the scripture they do, three things that's going to help you face your fear. Are you ready? ready. I'm going to give it to you now. If you're writing notes, or you're taking notes, uh, go ahead and write it down. Number one, the first thing you need to do, do is let go. Some say let go. let go. Let go. See, some of you just need to let go of your fear. Number two, you need to look up. Some say look up. Look up. Look up. See, some of you are looking around, you're looking down, you're looking to the side, but you're not looking up. And God says to you, you need to look up. So number one, you need to let go. Number two, you need to look up. The third thing you need to do is launch out. Some say launch out. Launch out. Now, there are, there are reasons why these guys are scared, and, and, and there are things that, that take place, and I'm not saying that, that, that your fear is illegitimate, okay? You may have a legitimate fear. Pharaoh was a legitimate fear because Pharaoh was coming to exact judgment and vengeance. And he was going to come back and he was going to drag them back into slavery. And when they saw Pharaoh coming and they were afraid, it was a legitimate fear. And some of you have legitimate fears. Some of you don't, but some of you do. Now, how did they react? What happened when they saw Pharaoh? Well, there are a couple of things. They got, they got skeptical. They got cynical. They got caustic. They got judgmental. They took a look at Moses and they said, Moses, it's your fault. It's amazing how that we begin to blame people around us when we get fearful. We begin to point fingers when we get fearful. Leadership doesn't look so good in a, in a spirit of fear. And so they got skeptical. They got cynical. They got, they got sarcastic. They said, was it because? Can you hear it? Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to die? What are they doing? They're being sarcastic. There's all kinds of graves in Egypt. And so they're, they're being cynical toward leadership. They're being cynical in their spirit. Not only, does, not only does, does, does fear make us cynical, it makes us selfish. They said, why did you bring us out here? Did you bring us out here to die? And, 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 and so what, what does that say to me? Here's what it says to me. All they're thinking about is them. They're not thinking about God's glory. They don't have their eyes on God. They've got their eyes on themselves. And, 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 and they're, they're afraid for their bacon. They're afraid something's going to happen. We're going to be taken back into Egypt. My children are going to become slaves. We thought we were free, but now we're not. And so, and so what did they do? They became cynical. They became skeptical. Uh, skeptical. They became selfish. They, began, they, they focused only on themselves, they blamed other people, and they became short-sighted. You say, where do you see that? Oh, it's right there. Verse 12, it says, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the desert. It, really? Come on, really? I mean, in, the, in Egypt, you were slaves. In Egypt, you were in bondage. In Egypt, you were maligned. In Egypt, you were mistreated. In Egypt, you were, you were worse than animals. You were treated like you were worse than animals. In Egypt, man, you had it terrible in Egypt. Would it really be better for you to have been in Egypt than to die in the desert? Not really. But at that point, they were short-sighted. See, fear causes us to want to live in the past. Can I say that again? There are people who want to live in the past simply because of fear. And they remember the good old days. Listen, there were no good old days back in, the, back in Egypt. And these people preferred bondage than, uh, to uncertainty. Let me say it again. 
I said they prefer, there are some people who prefer bondage than un, uh, to uncertainty. They said, I would rather live in bondage than live in fear. Because I'm not certain about my future. I'm not certain about what's going to happen. If I make this decision over here, this decision over here is going to affect my future over here. If I say, I don't want to live in sin anymore. And I go to my girlfriend, and I say, God's dealing with me. She might leave me altogether. Do I want to live in sin? Or do I want to please God? If I go to my boss, and I tell my boss, I don't want to cook the books anymore, I might lose my job. But if I continue to cook the books, I'm going to be miserable. Because God has started to work in my life. And there are some people that prefer bondage in sin to uncertainty in their future. If I stop hanging out with my friends, although I know hanging out with them isn't doing me any good because I hang out with them and we smoke a little bit of dope and we drink a little bit of booze and we do a little something, something, and, and, and I'm hanging out. But, but if, I, if I say to them, I don't want to do that anymore, I'm not going to have any friends anymore. And so there's some people that prefer bondage and sin to uncertainty. If I tell my husband I can't do that anymore, he's going to leave me. He's going to find somebody else. Is that what's going to happen? No, that's not what's going to happen. But the devil's telling you that's what's going to happen. And the fact of the matter is you're not trusting God for your future. Because if you trusted God for your future and you stop cooking the books, even if the man fires you, God's going to get you a new job. He's going to get you a better job. He's going to get you probably a better job with better hours and better pay because God is in control and God is testing you. And God's saying, are you going to trust me in this thing? Or are you going to lean on your own understanding? And are you going to try to work it out the way you've always tried to work it out? And you're going to keep trying to do what you do like you do it. Because And, and listen, you keep trying to do what you do like you do it, you're going to continue to be where you've been. You're always going to be what you've always been and have what you've always had and be where you've always See, if you want to get out from where you've been and have something you've never had and do something you've never done, you've got to step out on faith and trust God for your future because God wants to bring you to another level. But God can't take you to another level unless you're willing to trust him. Some say, trust him. Trust him. So what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Three things. You let go, you look up, and you launch out. Are you with me? Are you with me now? All right, let's do this thing. Number one, you let go. Some say, let go. You need to let go. What does it say? Exodus 14, 13, don't be afraid. Some say, don't be afraid. Say it like you mean, don't be afraid. Say it like you're bad to the bone. Don't be afraid. 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 You say, Pastor, why are you saying it so many times? Because there are 365 fear nots in the Bible. One for every day of the year. There's a fear not for Monday and a fear not for Tuesday and a fear not for Wednesday and a fear not for Thursday. And there's a fear not for Friday and Saturday and Sunday. And if you wake up the next day and you still got some fear, God's going to stand in front of you and he's going to say, son, fear not. I am with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Though you go through the fire, you're not going to be burned. Though you go through the water, you're not going to be drowned. I'm going to uplift you and uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Hallelujah. Fear not. My Lord. Fear not, church. Fear not. How do you let go of fear? There's only one way. Recognize and remind yourself God's in control. I said, you got to recognize and remind yourself God's in control. Let me ask you a question. Who brought them to Pihahai Roth? Two of you got it. Who brought them to where they were? God. They took a look at Moses and they said, Moses, you did this. Moses didn't have anything to do with it. It was God. 
God said to Moses, we read it in verse 1, tell the Israelites to camp between Pihiroth and Baal Zephon. And when they got there and they saw the Red Sea behind them, mountains on either side, it didn't occur to God that maybe he made a mistake. Oh, oh, yeah, because here's Pharaoh. No, no, no. He told him beforehand, Pharaoh's going to do this. I already got you covered. I brought you here. Because I brought you here, I'm going to take care of you. Because where God guides, he provides. Amen. And when God guides, he provides. God's going to take care of his children. Are you with me? Here's the, here, here, here's the thing. If you find yourself between Pihiroth and Baal Zephon, and there's a Red Sea behind you, and there's a Pharaoh breathing down your neck, just understand, it's a setup. God's setting up the devil for defeat, and he's setting you up for a miracle. It's a divine setup. I don't feel, I, I, I kind of feel sorry for the devil because the devil, <laughs> old Pharaoh, he must have looked at them and licked his chops and wrung his hands and said, we got him now, boys. And little did he know, in about 24 hours, he's going to be swimming on the bottom of the sea because God was in control. He was going to take care of his children. He was going to make a way where there was no way. He had a plan to defeat the devil. He had a plan to preserve his people. Oh, come on. I'm preaching better than your amen in this morning. Oh, yeah. See, God's got a plan. He's got a plan to keep you in. He's got a plan to lift you up. He's got a plan to take you through. God's plan isn't going to take you around. God's plan sometimes is not going to take you over. God's plan sometimes is to take you right through. He said you're going to pass through the Red Sea, and sometimes you just got to go through some things to get through some things. But God is going to take you to the other side. Oh, yeah, yeah. Somebody say, yeah. Can I get a witness in this house this morning? Oh, yeah, you're going to be going through some stuff, but you're going to get through it. The coach might not like you, but you're going to get through it. Your boss may give you a hard time, but you're going to get through it. You may be experiencing some thin times now, but there's a blessing on the way. Don't give up. Trust God. He's going to take care of you. Oh, yeah. God had it in control. God was setting them up for a miracle. Why does God lead us into, into impossible situations? Because God wants to get glory for himself. God wants to be glorified. He wants you to grow, and he wants to be glorified. So number one, let go. Somebody say let go. Let go. Number two, what do you need to do? Look up. Look up. What does he say? Exodus 14, verse 13. Stand firm and see. See, S-E-E. 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 S -E -E. S-E-E. -E. They were afraid of the S-E-A. Mm. But they needed to do the S-E-E. -E. Problem with you is you are too full of, full of the S-E-A. You're worried about the S-E-A. You're concerned about the S-E-A. God, it's the S-E-A. And God said, it's the S-E-E. -E. You're doing the SEA when you ought to be doing the SEE. If you were doing the SEE, you wouldn't care about the SEA. Because the SEA is under control of the SEE. You getting this? I didn't put this in my notes, but it's good. Yeah. And what does he say? Stand firm, stand still, and see. What does he tell? Why does he tell them to stand still? Because <laughs> they're ready to boogie. Whenever you fear, it's flight or fight. And whenever you get afraid, I think I'll go ahead and just change my job. I've got a problem here. I think I just quit school. It's not working out. I think I'll just bail on my marriage. I'm just going to leave and shake the dust off my feet. I'm going to get out of this one horse town. This is not working for me. This must not be God's will. No, it is God's will. The problem is you just need to stand still. But I want to quit, Pastor. No, you need to stand still. But I want to check out. No, you need to stand still. I want to give up. No, you need to stand still. Why do I need to stand still? Because you can't see God when you're on the run. 
And God wants to bring glory to himself. And the only way he can bring glory to himself is you, if you see what he's doing. You can't see what he's doing if your back's turned. Some of you, all the picture that some people have in their mind of you is this. Come on now. God didn't call you to look like this. God called you to look like this. Come on. Does that look good or what? Yeah. God called you to stand. Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, you need to stand, therefore. What we need is we need some men who can stand. We need some women who can stand. We need some church members who can stand. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. And I need some tough people who's going to stand with me when the going gets tough. When the heat is turned up in the kitchen, everybody's not looking for a window and trying to bail out some door. But they're saying, Pastor, we're going to stand with you because we believe God has raised us up to do something. We believe God has raised us up to change a generation. We believe God has raised us up to impact a city. And we know it's going to get hot. And we know the devil's not going to like it and we know it's going to get tough but pastor we're not going to run on you we're not going to run out on you we're here for the long haul hallelujah we're here to stand with you come on do I have anybody who's going to stand with me when the going gets tough is there any men who's going to stand with your family when all hell breaks loose? Are there any women who are going to stand by your man and stand by your Jesus and say, it doesn't matter what happens, I'm going to stay and I'm going to believe God against all hope. I'm going to hope. Oh, yeah, the devil might be trying to tear up my family. He might have my, my husband and a ring in his nose, and my baby might be doing something right now he ought not to be doing. But I'm going to stand, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to believe God, and I'm going to be like my mama who didn't run out on my daddy, and I'm going to pray, and I'm not going to run out on my husband. I am going to trust God that God's going to get a hold of him and bring him home. I'm going to stand for my husband. I'm going to stand for my family. I'm going to stand for my baby. Everybody else has given up on him, but I'm not going to give up on him. He might be acting like an idiot now. Come on. Some of you have idiots in your house. I know. I had some. It's like they took a stupid pill. When they turn 15 or 16, it's like, who are you? Who are you? But I see him preaching the word of God today. Yeah, I'm talking about that idiot. I see him preaching the word of God and I see the anointing of God upon his life and I see him fulfilling his destiny and I see my grandchildren and I see him being a good daddy and a good husband and a good father and I say, thank God I didn't kill him. Come on now, you know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, we just need somebody to stand. Who's going to stand? So much of the church has been filled with a spirit of fear. Somebody said that the spirit of Ephraim and Manasseh has encroached into the church and gotten a hold of our hearts. And the Bible says in Psalm 103 that although they were armed with spears and bows on the day of battle, that Ephraim and Manasseh turned and ran. We've got too many people that are armed with the with the weapons of their warfare, but they're running. And God says, stop running. Stand. The Bible says that Shama took a stand 
in a bean full of lentils. And he defeated the enemy. You'll never, you'll never defeat the enemy unless you take a stand. You got to take a stand. Turn to your neighbor and tell him you got to take a stand. It's interesting to me. They, they looked everywhere. These guys looked everywhere. You know, and the thing is, look up. I mean, they looked to the left, and there was mountains. They looked to the right, and there was mountains. They looked to one another. Moses, why did you bring us out here? Seemed like they looked all around, but the, uh, the place they didn't look was up. They looked to the right, to the left, to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. They looked everywhere but up. Listen, you look to, the, to, to, to one another, you'll be depressed. You look around you, you'll be stressed. But if you look up, you'll be blessed. Somebody say, look out. Or look up, rather. Somebody say, look up. Look out, I'm looking up. Look out. Now, can you imagine these guys? They're looking around. They're looking around. All of a sudden, they see Pharaoh. Moses! Hey, 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 Joe, go tell Mo. I see something. Yo. It's a little spot of dust. I don't know what it is. It's getting bigger. It's getting bigger. They come to Moses. Moses, 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 Moses. You know how your children come to you sometimes? Mama, 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 mama. Daddy, 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 daddy. Moses, 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 Moses. Moses said, what? He said, look, look, look. There's something over there, Moses. They're coming. It's getting bigger. Moses. It's getting bigger. Moses, 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 Moses. I see, I see, I see the glimmering of a, of a, of a chariot. Moses, 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 Moses. It's Pharaoh. Moses, 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 Moses. Mo- ah, he's coming. He's, he's there. Moses, ah, do something. I think Moses just wanted to slap him. Get a hold of yourself. They freaked out because they were looking at Pharaoh. And God could have took care of Pharaoh back there. (laughs) If I'm Moses, I'm saying, God, for his sake, send a lightning bolt and just wipe him out. You're going to kill him anyway. Right? We know the story. He's riding a chariot now. He feels good now. Life is good now. He's got air conditioning now. Things are happening now. But in 24 hours, buddy, you're swimming on the bottom of the sea without scuba gear. We know the story. You're dead. God wins. I read it. Now, if I'm Moses, I'm going, God, do it now. Because God God had already told Moses. You didn't read it? God had already said, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to take you here. Pharaoh's going to think you're hemmed in. Pharaoh's going to come, and I am going to get glory. Moses knows the end of the story. Moses knows this guy's toast. And if I'm Moses, I'm going, God, for his sake, wipe him out now. God doesn't do it. Moses, 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 Moses. The closer it gets, God, please, for his wife's sake, do it now. Comes closer, closer. Moses, Moses, Moses. God, for my sake. Is that or I'm going to kill him myself? Now, why does God wait? Not until midnight. He waits until five after midnight. Because they have to go through the sea. They have to get through the other side. He's still on their tail. God has separated them, but then he removes his pot, and they come through, and they're in the middle, and, and, and they're running up the hill on the other side, and they're saying, he's still coming. Right? 
motion. Do you ever have one of those dreams? Everything's in slow motion, man. And you're running from somebody. Motion. <laughs> That's what I picture. He's still coming. <laughs> Why does God wait? Why, <laughs> Why does God wait? God, just do it now. Heal me now. Save my husband now. Bring that wayward child home now. But no, 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 no. God waits. He waits, he waits, he waits, not until midnight, but five after, 10 after, 15 after, 20 after, when I can't stand it anymore, finally, when I give up trying to do it on my own, when I give up even hoping for it, when I give up and don't think that it's ever going to happen, then God comes in and God says, I just wanted you to know that it wasn't going to be you with all your preaching and all your nagging and all your this and all your that. It wasn't going to be by, because it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by my spirit hallelujah and listen when you do it it might be done or it might not be done but when i do it it's going to be done hallelujah they're going to be saved and they're really going to be saved Whew. my lord i better hurry on i'm already past time we need to end let's pray and say you want me to go and give me five more minutes come on somebody say give me five let me see your hands five ten fifteen twenty uh all right, let's move on. Launch out. Some say launch out. Tell the people to move on. See, sometimes we just need to get it in gear. Sometimes we need to pray. Sometimes we need to wait. But sometimes we just need to, we need to move out. There's a time to pray and there's a time to move. There's a time to fast and there's a time to, to, time to move. And here he says, tell the people to move out. And sometimes we just need to launch out. We need to lay it on the line. We need to forge ahead. We need to take the plunge. And they did it literally. Now, Pastor, what are you saying? I, I, I'm saying faith. If we live by faith, folks, listen, faith isn't a thing. That's a noun. And faith is a noun. It's a, you know, we know what a noun is, right? Person, place, or thing. Learn that in third grade. A noun is a person, place, or thing. And yes, faith is a thing. It's a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen, it's a thing. Faith is a noun. But can I say to you, it's more than a noun, it's also a verb. Because my Bible says, by faith, Abraham left. By faith, Noah built. By faith, Moses refused. By faith. So faith isn't just something you have, it's something you do. It's something you do. And so we need, to, we need to realize that we need to take action. We need to step out. We need to launch out. We need to forge ahead. You'll never walk on water unless you get out of the boat. Are you with me? You see, everybody has fear. We started off by saying that. Many of you have, have fears. There are dozens of fears here. But according to bio, bi biologists... According to biologists, there are only two legitimate fears that you and I have. Only two legitimate fears that we grew up with. The fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. You take your baby. You take, you take any baby. Babies aren't afraid of snakes. Babies aren't afraid of cockroaches. They're not afraid of spiders. They're not afraid of mice, Jamie. That is a learned fear. You were not born with that fear. You did not come out of the womb saying, mice. <laughs> See, we have a cat, and she's a hunter. My cat went out the other day, hunted, brought home the meat. Big black mouse laid it on my porch right in front of my door and said, 
God bless you. <laughs> what did I do? I came out and went, thank you, no. I took that, 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 that mouse and did what every man would do. I scooted it out to the edge, and I did a drop kick. <laughs> it hit my tree in the front yard and fell down. Three points. That was before my tree lost its leaves. I forgot all about the mouse. Fall came, leaves fell, Jamie got the rake. You see where I'm going. It was a beautiful Saturday morning. I was cleaning the garage. Jamie had taken the rake. And all of a sudden, I heard a scream that made my blood curdle. It put goosebumps all over my body. I thought my wife was dead. I mean, she screamed. The entire neighborhood woke up. And it was a mouse. It really was a beautiful, beautiful time. I wish I could have got it on camera. But honey, you were not born with that. Let it go. We only, we only have two legitimate fears. Everything else is learned. We learn to fear those things. Now look, if you learned it, you can unlearn it. And you just need to let it go. You need to look up. And you need to launch out. I'm ending with this. I've kept you far too long. Years ago, back in the 1800s, it's been over 100 years ago, there was a guy by the name of Charles Blondin. Some of you have heard of him. Charles Blondin was the greatest tightrope walker the world has ever seen. Charles Blondin, his great feat was walking across the Niagara Falls. He had a rope that was stretched 1,100 feet long, 160 feet above Niagara Falls. And to begin his act, he would take one of those long poles and he would go out on the, on, on the rope and people would watch him and this was back when, I mean, nobody had ever seen this before. And he's out there, and, and, and he's, you know, doing this. Everybody's going, ah. Oh. And then about halfway out there, he'd take, the, he'd take the pole and he'd throw it away. And the ladies would, ah. Oh. And then he'd do this. Ah. Oh. Ah. Oh. And then he'd do this. Ah! And then, ah! Kid you not. He would lay down. I mean, one time he walked it on stilts. This guy was amazing. Another time he did it blindfolded. One time, kid you not, did the research. One time he took uh, a pan. And I know how I did it, with eggs, bacon, ham, onions, chopped green peppers. He made himself an omelet and ate it out there. I'm not kidding. The most amazing tightrope walker the world has ever seen. One day, people gathered. And he took a wheelbarrow, and he, took, he went across on a wheelbarrow. And on the other side, he took a sack of potatoes, and he threw it in. And he brought a sack of potatoes across on the wheelbarrow. Came back to the other side, he threw another sack in. Went back across. Got there, threw a third sack in, came back across. When he started doing that, they started saying, blonde in, blonde in, blonde in, blonde in. Put another sack in. Blonde in. Blonde in. Blonde. He came back across with that third sack. Blonde. I mean, it was pandemonium. Blonde in. Blonde in. He said, how many of you think I could do this blindfolded? Blonde in. Blonde in. Blonde in. We believe. We believe. He took the three sacks of potatoes and he dumped them out. 
He said, do you really believe? They said, we believe. Do you really believe? We believe. Then one of you, get in. (laughs) They didn't really believe. (laughs) And they stood there and they looked at one another. And then one little lady, little old lady, stepped out of the crowd, got in the wheelbarrow, Blondin took her across and brought her back. That little old lady just happened to be his mother who knew him and trusted him and knew that he could do it. The reason we don't step out on faith is because we don't know him. And because we don't know him, we don't trust him. But if we really knew him, would have iced tea at the Red Sea (laughs) along with a hamburger with extra onions because we know God's in control. And if God brought us here, he's going to work it out. If he said we're going to get to the other side, we're going to get to the other side. And sometimes we don't go around and sometimes we don't go over, but sometimes we go through. And whatever we're going through, by God's grace, we're going through. What is it that's causing you to fear? What you need to do is you need to let go. You need to look up and you need to launch out. You need to have faith in God. If you have faith in God, he's going to work it out. Bow your heads, let's pray.